Hey everyone, welcome to my channel. And in this video, we are going to be working on a Honda 3813 uh, riding lawnmower with a liquid cooled engine two cylinder. So the owner wanted me to get this machine to do a full once over on the machine. Uh, there's a few issues going on with it. Uh, one to start off with, there's some sort of safety switch issue where the machine will not start sometimes and then other times it will. And then uh, there's something going on with the drivetrain. Uh, this one is actually a gear shift in comparison to the hydrostatic. Uh, it is uh, five speed. And from what I can tell, this machine is, is definitely in good shape considering its age. And uh, I'm going to be performing a water pump and timing belt change. And I'm pretty sure after looking at the drive shaft that the front damper is worn out. Now I've never worked on a 3813 before, so it's going to be a little bit of a discovery process. Uh, initial observations that I see here, um, I'll have to pull the service manual, but it looks like I can remove the battery tray, it's held them by four bolts, and then I should be able to get pretty easy access to the front damper and take off the timing belt cover. I don't know if I'll have enough room in there to take out the flywheel uh, to get it loose from the uh, crankshaft, but we'll see. And uh, I'm still going to have to take apart the whole back of the machine anyway because I want to look at the gear shift clutch to make sure that's okay. And obviously I'll have to look at the uh, drive shaft to make sure that's not worn out. The good thing with this machine is that there's no fluid leaks, there's no oil leaks or anything like that. The coolant uh, system looks in good shape. And uh, the front clutch hasn't been used in a number of years. He's actually been using this, uh, the owner's been using this particular tractor for hauling stuff around his yard. I think he was using it to haul like a yard cart of some sort. But uh, again, this machine is in really good shape, so let's get into it. First thing we're going to do is we're going to take off the rear fender. Uh, there's two bolts in the front here. I believe there's a couple bolts underneath. You'll have to take out the four bolts that hold the seat on here. There's a couple grommets in the front and uh, you will have to take the emergency brake apart as well. I'm not taking out this uh, assembly here. I just took the rubber boot off and I actually took the cable apart. The cable is routed underneath here. There's a bolt here and a bolt here and uh, it's routed up underneath here out of the way from the tire. So once you snake that through, you can just leave that down to the side here and this should uh, pretty much pop right off. All right, to remove the back fender area, uh, there's a bolt here that's 10 millimeter. You're gonna have four 12 uh, millimeter bolts that hold the seat in. You're gonna have to take this uh, wire that's for the seat uh, safety switch and just push that through the grommet. There is also two 12 millimeter bolts up here in the front. And finally, there are two 10 millimeter bolts here on the side that hold the gear shift, one and two. And that should get the rear section of the machine completely apart. So already when removing the rear end of the machine here, I can already tell that uh, there's definitely a damper problem. Here's your clutch for the transmission, and this is all your linkage. And I can, if you can listen to this, you hear that? That's the rubber damper. It's got a lot of play in that. Now I have this in neutral, but if I were to put this in gear, uh, you have the same amount of play, and the engine is not spinning when I do that. I'm not really putting a lot of pressure at all that's definitely telling me that we have a front damper problem. We also seem to be having some linkage issues here and I do see a lot of rust. If I put this into gear, let's see if I go put it into fifth gear and now I can push the tractor forward. As you can see, the transmission is spinning but the clutch is not engaging. Now it'll engage but it takes a few minutes. It looks like we may have to look at some lubrication issues either with this cylinder or maybe the clutch itself. We'll have to look. So moving on to the next step, we are going to remove the foot plate uh, to remove that to expose the rest of the drive shaft and to start to gain access to the upper uh, half of the drivetrain, which is right behind the engine. Okay, so to remove the foot plate is a little bit more complex, but I'll show you which bolts that you need to take apart. You are going to have to remove the console here, at least the plastic portion of it, in order to take the foot plate off. You're going to start with two 10 millimeter bolts here, two 10 millimeter bolts underneath the rubber uh, grip here. That's on this side. Same thing on for this side, two bolts here, and then two 10 millimeters up in the front. That'll release the foot plate from the frame, but now you're going to have to remove this 
uh, shroud here. There's a bunch of shoulder bolts that are uh, Phillips head. So one, two, three, four, and then five and six on the other corner here. And then the hidden one is once you remove the steering wheel, which is right here. You'll also need to remove the 12 millimeter bolt that holds the PTO arm here, which is located right here. And finally, when you remove the steering wheel, it's a 17 millimeter bolt, and uh, I would suggest using an impact on it. That way, it, uh, if it's on there too tight, you just hold on to the uh, steering wheel, and it's keyed so it'll pop right off. And finally, here, all the Molex connectors that are running up to the console here, you just disconnect them. I think there's one, two, the lights three, I believe there's three right there. Once you do that, then this entire assembly should come completely out. And now that exposes the foot plate till you can remove it. So a few other points when taking apart the foot plate. Uh, I did remove the battery. I was going to have to remove it anyway. Uh, the gear shift column here is going to have to be removed. I put some tape on it. It's currently in neutral so it doesn't hang down. It's held in by a 12 millimeter bolt here and then a 10 millimeter bolt right here. You can uh, just put them back into the studs so you don't lose them. Already in comparison to the 4514, this is going to be a lot more straightforward once I remove the battery plate. I won't need to, doesn't look like I'm going to need to take out this entire pedestal, which is really good. Uh, this kind of gives you an idea too. That squeaking is coming from that front damper for sure. And I can almost guarantee you that it is going to need to be replaced. So the next thing I'm going to do is remove the battery plate. It is held in by one bolt here. And then there's another bolt right here. And I believe that this little piece here, I'll have to clean this out where the relays and all the other electronics are, held in by a few bolts here. If I can get a good picture of it. I'll clean that up and show you. Here we are on the bench, just wanted to show everyone the dampers. Here is the rear damper with the collet inside. This one is actually in pretty good shape. As you can see, it uh, still has uh, pretty much the remainder of the uh, rubber material, and this is what centerizes it. Over here is the one uh, that was at the flywheel. I did break this. This is uh, an easily replaceable item. Let me focus a little bit more in on this. Uh, what you can see here on the front damper, we caught it just in time. As you can see, it still has its shape uh, with the outer spokes here, but you can see how you're starting to see the bare metal, and uh, eventually that would wear out to the point where it's starting to slip. It seems to uh, favor one side, so it'll start to flatten out on one, on one of these two sides here, and then one of the other third sides will remain okay. So it'll start to pivot inside and eventually you'll start feeling the vibration and that's what uh, is a good indicator that you need to replace your dampers. Okay, I was able to get the flywheel removed using my previous method with a socket and using a strap wrench to get it secured. I did have to spray a little WD-40 on it and uh, put some heat to it for about three minutes. Once I did that, it popped right off and it looks like that the charge coils are in pretty decent shape, a little nick right there, but nothing to be concerned about. And uh, everything else here looks pretty good. So uh, we're going to replace the timing belt and the water pump and uh, go from there. Uh, I do see a little spot right here. It looks like it was starting to go. Definitely do. But uh, yeah, this is a lot, I'm going to say it's a lot easier to get access to this without having to take this pedestal piece off to uh, service this machine. So now that the I can have access to the back of the engine here, I'm going to turn my attention to this clutch in the back here and see exactly what's going on. My guess is that this uh, mechanism either is worn out or needs to be cleaned, and may, this may need to be replaced as well. Uh, this is the, the piston that delays the clutch engagement so you can basically shift on the fly. So here we are working on the Bravo machine, uh, the 3813. We got the machine stripped down. I removed the charging coils and we are currently uh, replacing the timing belt and the water pump. These are the new parts. I did notice that the timing marks, if uh, I can see past the camera here, uh, there's an F for fire and T for time. And there's a little uh, timing mark below here. And if we can 
show here. Here's the timing mark right here and here on the crankshaft. I saw that it was it had jumped the tooth on the old timing belt. I don't know if it was because if it stretched out or not, but uh, we're able to get that corrected here. This is the new water pump. Now what we'll do is uh, we'll push this across, get it tightened up, and then these get torqued down to I believe seven and a half foot pounds. There's one here, two, three underneath here, and then the hidden one is on the other side. I'll show you. Like on the 4514, there's that hidden bolt, but this one is far easier to get access to. It's right here, and uh, it's a 10 millimeter. And here we are at the bench. I did take the old water pump out, and as you could see here, uh, it's definitely been wearing down, but even if the teeth were okay, listen to the bearings. The bearings were starting to go in the water pump, and that meant that this was going to fail at some point. So it's a good thing that we're changing it. Okay, we got the drive shaft reinstalled and the battery tray reinstalled, and then as well the timing belt cover uh, behind the engine. In the order that you really should do it, you should put the timing belt cover and water pump cover back on first, get everything all squared away there, put all the wires and whatnot over uh, on the sides here to make sure they're all zip tied and taken care of. Then you do the drive shaft. Now the drive shaft, it does have new dampers uh, with the exception of the rear one. The rear one was just fine. Uh, the front one gets the most stress. Highly suggest you put the dampers in with the centering collet inside. Put a little bit of lithium white grease so it doesn't stick together. It is gonna be a tight fit. Uh, you have to install it as one unit basically. There's not really a lot of room between the clutch and the flywheel. Once you get it in place, I would suggest doing the rear one first. These dampers are hub-centric, meaning that there's a lit ring inside that will centerize it on the, uh, on the clutch and also on the flywheel. Then you tor torque down the uh, 12 millimeter bolts here. You do this one in the back first, and because you could spin it around easier, and then you have to match up the one up in the front. Once you get to that point, and again, you have a lot of gracious room underneath here. If the battery tray wasn't installed, you could still do it that way. Uh, if you put the battery tray in first, which is what I did, but it probably would have been easier if I did the drive shaft first before putting in the battery tray components. With the battery tray, it's going to go back together like an erector set. I would suggest making sure that you get everything in its relative position first with all the bolts loose. Once you do, uh, then you can tighten them down. It's gonna be a little difficult to get it in between these uh, two uh, tube frame pieces here. It'll be a tight fit because it's held in by a notch here. And then you have one bolt here, one bolt on the other side, one, two, and then three right here for one of the uh, wire holders. On the left side, it's very much the same. You have, again, the bolt here. This holds the negative battery cable, two 12 millimeters right here. And I believe that is it. Once you get that in place, tighten it all together. And there's also, oh, almost forgot to mention, there's two 10 millimeter bolts right here. You'll have to remove this Molex connector to get to this one. And then up here, there's another 10 millimeter to uh, remove the platform here that holds all the electronics. You don't necessarily have to take that out. You just need to loosen it so you can maneuver the battery tray in position. It may fight you but it will be the better course to go by just loosening that. I've already zip tied and put away all the wires to where they were before. Uh, I got a new ignition coil in just like I did on the 4514. The long wire goes to the front cylinder and the short wire goes to the back cylinder and I got some new noise suppressors too. Just a good idea to change both the ignition and the suppressors. These are separate parts from the ignition. One minor note on the timing belt cover, once you get all the 10 millimeter bolts put back together, if I can look underneath here, see that one right there? Uh, that you don't have to take all the way out because of the steering column here. You just need to loosen it in order to get it out. Now that all this section is done, I'm gonna put the uh, floorboard back in and start putting back together the pedestal. Okay, so it's starting to look more like a tractor. Got the floorboard back in, eight bolts that, that hold it in, 10 millimeter. Put the clutch put, uh, pedal back in, and then the PTO arm back in. Reconnected all the wires for the, uh, for the pedestal and the dashboard, and got this reinstalled as well. 
Uh, now we're just working on the back of the tractor right now, making sure that the linkage is all adjusted properly for the gear shift. This just needed to be cleaned up and this uh, piston needed to be cleaned as well. So it allows you to shift on the fly. Now I'm doing the fuel filter and here it is right here. Make sure the metal part goes towards the fuel pump. All right guys, learn from my mistakes. I had to take the pedestal off one more time and the timing belt cover off. I made a mistake on the air grab of the ignition coil. You can't see it on camera, uh, but it's a uh, 16 thousandths of an inch, uh, give or take 8 thousandths of an inch tolerance. I used uh, a business card, but it was laminated, so that meant that it was too far away. When I went to go start it up, I was getting a spark intermittently and a weak spark and then nothing at all. Uh, this is your ground here. This is what uh, all the safety switches go to. If you disconnect this, this basically bypasses all of the safety switches in the machine so that it will kill the spark if you have one of those safety switches uh, activated. If you take this off, you can just bypass them all to try and troubleshoot the coil. And I disconnected that and I was still getting an intermittent spark. Unfortunately, I had to take it apart one more time, so learn from my mistake. Use the feeler, feeler gauge. Oh, there you go. You can see it on camera now. Uh, 16 thousandths of an inch is what you need, plus or minus uh, 8 thousandths of an inch is the tolerance. All right, guys, here's the final. Got the engine running, all put back together. Bleeded out the air in the uh, radiator system. Timing belt and the uh, water pump have been changed. No leaks and... Uh, had to clean up the electronics pretty good. This sat outside for about a year. This is the Bravo machine and a lot of fine dust inside the relays. So I was having a little trouble with the ignition coil. I had the air gap too big, but then I also was having problems with that kill, kill wire. It was still killing the ignition. And I did have to go and bypass the seat switch since they no longer make them, but this will prevent it from uh, shutting down the, the engine if you are get off the seat. Not the ideal situation, but this is the best way to get it going. Parking brake's been adjusted and the uh, clutch mechanism has been cleaned up too. So I thank everyone for watching and uh, on to the next machine to repair. Have a good one guys, cheers.